Hello, this is Scott with US Ignite again. Right now I'm going to talk about Docker files in Docker. Uh, Docker files are a common way that people use to build images as they need them or maintain new build images and version them over time. Uh, we've been doing a lot of command line stuff with Docker, which is great to get to know and you'll mix some of that in always in, in, in almost all your uses of Docker. But very often people simplify that into a, doc, a build process for Docker images in a Docker file. Um, and there's different scenarios you can use that in. They're pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and show you one of the first scenario, which is actually the most complex, which is just using a Docker file to build Docker images and pushing them manually back to your repository, or perhaps not pushing them back and keeping them on a, on a local system. So up in this corner here, you have a Docker file. Docker, um, actually, let me go ahead and show you the anatomy of a Docker file first. So you have some, some picture of what we're what we're talking about here. So let me instead go over and I will look at the Docker file reference. Um, Docker, a Docker file is just a plain old text file uh, that comes with a lot of directives. You can uh, say from, uh, from is what base image you're gonna use to build, a, to build your new image from. Again, you've seen Docker always starts with some sort of base image. It's often a trusted image, but can be an image from another user or, or an image you've put out before. Uh, that really doesn't matter, but you can build up these uh, from over time the name of the maintainer, you can give it commands to run, you can give it a command after it runs to run at when the when the container is executed, labels or arbitrary values, expose ports, give it environmental variables. I'll show you an actual uh, example of this in a minute. You can add or copy files into it. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, you can give it an entry point. So anytime someone does additional commands, it always has it prepended with an entry point value. You can define volumes, users, lots of different, different things in these um, in these Docker files. So I, what I'm going to do is I have a small Docker file application. Um, it's a Flask application that I'm going to run. Uh, I'm going to build the Docker uh, image from, and then I'm going to run it in a container and let you see what the results of that is. Um, so as I said, this is just a small a small um, text file that allows you to, to put commands in that need to be run as you're building your Docker image. Uh, the first thing is I tell from, so I'm gonna use this base image. Um, often what I do is I pull down a Python base image and here you can see since it's not prepended with the username, it has no namespace. So it's an official, it's what they call official image from Docker Hub. It's the Python image and the, the tag is three Alpine. So I'm gonna use a Python three image. One of the things I like about using Docker containers and Docker images to run Python applications is I don't have to get involved in that whole Python 2 or Python 3 command structure and, and where you should I do pip 3 or something like that. I just pull down the version I want and it just operates a normal Python. And since these are sandbox environments, I can have as many as I want. I'm declaring the maintainers myself. You should always put some maintainer note that's sort of a blame who to go back to. Uh, I'm giving it a run command. So as it's building this Docker image, what this Docker file is telling it to do is run the command pip install flask and request. So it's gonna do those two Python dependencies. Uh, and since, I, since this is a Docker container that I'm gonna build up over time, I don't have to mess things like with things like a virtual environment. Uh, my container is my virtual environment in this case. So uh, that frees me some, from some complexities there. Uh, I'm giving it a volume. Again, I, uh, I, I haven't gotten into that, but since I'm gonna be copying, you'll see below, there's this copy command. I'm gonna be copying all of this code into that directory then I'm setting that as a volume because files might change in there and I don't want that to necessarily be part of the permanent, permanent image, although often you might want to, but in this case, I'm just setting it so you can see how volumes work. I'm exposing port 5000. When you run the typical Flask development web server, it runs by default on port 5000. So in this case, that's exactly what I'm doing. And I'm just exposing it, which is only half the equation. It's exposed, which means it's available to the outside world. But unless during my run command, I actually attach a host port to it, nothing will be able to happen over it. So I'm exposing that port and making it available. Uh, I'm giving it a copy command. So I'm telling it, as I said, as I said earlier, take the local directory files and copy them into the, the container directory op flask, flask app. Um, and I could use an add directive instead. There's an, uh, you might've seen when I quickly went over the documentation, there's an add directive that I could have done. They do similar things. The biggest difference between the command is add will let you specify a URL to, pass, to pull down files from. So if you have like a zip file online or something like that, you can go ahead and pull that down and maybe give it some run commands to unpack it later on. Uh, so Docker files are, again, so they're light build files. If you need robust builds, you can also specify things like Ansible um, and people often do that, but we're not going to get into it that specifically in this um, in this run through. 
You can do other things like set environmental variables. I'm doing that here. I'm giving an environmental variable flask app name and giving it this text string. Uh, I'll tell you why I'm doing that now so you can keep that in mind as you're looking at what I'm doing. Over in my, uh, it's a very simple flask app I have here. You see, I just have an index route. Um, I'm taking two things out and I'm reading with Python two environmental variables and I'm doing it in a way that it sets a, if it's not defined, it sets a default. So I'm the app name I'm reading out of app, uh, flask app name, because I'm going to put those in the template and uh, it just gives a default of nothing set if nothing's there and uh, an environmental variable flask instance name, uh, which I use primarily to set the container uh, name when I do it. So that this is an example of how people often set configuration settings in Docker applications. They often either copy in a local configurations file into the, do, the Docker image as it's being built. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes they copy it in at runtime. Another way of setting configuration values is to set their config files up to read environmental variables or set their application up to read environmental variables and then set those either in the Docker file. In the case of things like you might just want to set the app name, let's say, in the Docker file, but not the, or maybe a database port, but not the database connection string or database password and so forth. They'll, and they'll provide those environmental variables at runtime and define some of them at, at when they build the image. So here we're going to define this variable when we're building the image and we'll provide the instance name when we actually run the container and we'll give it the name of the container that we're going to run so you can see multiple containers running and how those uh, settings affect it. All right, um, also they set the working directory. So it's gonna take the op flask app as the working directory where the flask app uh code is going to sit and then I give it a command of python run.py so it's equivalent to do from command line from the working directory python run.py which is this file here which contains the uh, the meat of the, the light flask app and you see me before I've run commands uh, the command is part of the python run command line option before but since I'm providing a command directive as part of the build it doesn't need to do that so I won't need to provide the command for when I'm actually running running the container so you're going to see how that goes in a second. All right, let's go over to our command line. So Docker images, you can see what I have in the system. I just have the Python, uh, the Python Alpine 3, three Alpine um, uh, image and that's because I don't want to wait for that to pull down from the repository when I build my new image. Remember, that's going to be my base image. Uh, I don't have any Docker containers running. So let's go ahead and build uh, build this image. The you give it a tag name when you build an image, just like you've seen in previous episodes. So here I'll use Docker build. I'll give it a tag name of Streamweaver and my namespace Streamweaver slash DF demo and a tag of 0.1. And this dot tells it to use the Docker file in the current directory. Um, by default, it will look for a file named Docker file. You can pass the build command a flag to tell it use a Docker file of a different name in a different location if you want. But the, con the convention is almost always to create a Docker file that is just named Docker file with no extension and put that in the root of your project. And you can see that's what we've done here. Here's a Docker file sitting here with no extensions associated with it. All right, so if I build that, It'll go through its build process for a second. It tells you where it's pulling it from, what the maintainer is. So it goes through the directives in the Docker file. Then it begins to run the install and give you the output from the installation. Uh, it pulls down a couple of other images, exposing port 5000. Uh, and it goes through the images from the base image to build the final image. Uh, don't worry, again, don't worry about the uh, security warning at the end. That's just because I'm using Docker Toolbox on Windows. And that's going to go away here pretty soon uh, into a much better paradigm. So if I Docker images again, I now have Streamweaver DF demo 0 0.1 um, tag on my system and ready to go. So let's launch our first container. We've built our image from our Docker file. If we launch our container, we Docker run. So it's a typical Docker command, Docker run uh, dash D for the demon, running as a demon. I'm going to, I exposed port 5000. You saw that in my Docker file and I'm going to map it to port 80 on the host. So when I load it from my host, um, host URL, I, it can run it loaded as a normal web page. I'm naming this container DF Demo 80 just to keep track of it because I'm going to run up a few containers and I'm building, uh, I'm running this container from the image Streamweaver DF Demo 0.1. Uh, now you see me always enter some sort of command whether that's bin bash or Python run or something at the end of this. Since I defined that command in the Docker file, I don't need to do that here and that command will be run by default when I start the container. 
So if I hit container, it starts up quickly as it always does. Once you have everything built, I'm going to go over to, uh, I think I probably closed it. So let me get the IP number. Again, if you've done this before, you need to get the, um, if you're using Docker Toolbox on Windows or Mac, you need to worry about the IP number of the virtual image running your Docker system. Now, again, that's going to change in the next few weeks, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. But LS192.168. All right. So if I go over here and I pull up 192, 168, 80. Uh, so it's port 80 by default. If I go ahead and hit return, that brings up the small, uh, the template that I'm feeding those environmental variables into. And you might have seen this, a similar template in a previous show. So um, if we look over the template itself, I'm pulling those. Uh, a lot of, it's a little bit busy. Sorry about that. But here's app name here. So H1 in the, in the call out box is app name. And in the button, I'm putting the instance name variable. Now I set those as environmental variables. So what you're going to see is up here, the environmental variable that I set in the Docker file. And this is what it will always default to because I didn't override any of these. That is set to using Docker files episode four. The container instance would appear here uh, if there was anything set, but I didn't set it in the Docker file and I didn't pass it as part of the um, Docker uh, as part of the Docker run command. So there's nothing in that and nothing is going gonna, is gonna to happen with that. So let's go ahead and actually pass that in a new container. We'll leave this container running so you can see how multiple containers go. And we will pass that as part of the run command. So here again, Docker run, demonizing it, port, I'm going to use this time the host port 8080, mapping that to port 5000, that's the port we exposed in our Docker file. I'm going to name it DF demo 8080. I'm going to give it an environmental variable now of Flask uh, Flask instance name, which is that what that's looking for, and I'm going to call it DF Demo 80. And actually, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let me actually. Well, we'll call it that so you can see what it looks like when it when it outputs it. I meant to do it with the port host port name I'm using. So if I go ahead and of course it's building from the image stream over DF Demo uh, 0.1. So it that's already built with the Docker file. I don't need to rebuild it. So when I go ahead and hit return, that'll run a new image. And if I go Docker status, you can see, oh, Docker PS, I meant, it'll see these are my running containers. So I have two containers running. Uh, if I go over to my web page, I can pull back this and open it up in a new tab. And let me make sure I get the right port number. That's just reloading the same web page. This is 8080. And you can see the, the environmental variable that sets the title, that's staying the same, but I added in runtime the instance environmental variable, and that's what's being put out into this uh, into this button here. So that works pretty well. Um, and at very easy to, it's very easy to set up. Both of these are still running. So if I reload this page, by the way, it'll run just fine. It'll load just fine. Those are whole, two whole separate sandbox instances of Flask running, by the way. And they start up very quickly. So let's do a third option here. Let's go ahead and paste in. Um, this time I'm going to override the Flask app name as well. So it's it's the same as the command I just put in. This time I'm mapping the port, uh, the host port 8081 to the container port 5000. Uh, again, that's set in the exposed com uh, command of the Docker file. Uh, I'm giving it a different name of 8081. Uh, you see the, the previous Docker, um, the, the Flash the, the environmental variable I set earlier is here. This Flask app name, that's the environmental variable I set in the Docker, the Docker file itself. And what I'm doing by providing it at runtime is I'm giving it an override of what that is. So let me go ahead and hit return here. That will start up now. And I will go over to this web page and instead of 80, I want to do 8081. And you can see that pops up again with this uh, with this example here. So I've got three instances of Docker images running um, in, in the background there. So they're all running at the same time. PS, and I've got three uh, Docker. Oh, I, mean, it's, I forget it's always status or stats. There we go. Docker stats. 
and it tells you my the three instances it gives you real-time in information on those containers running it uh, gives you the pids they're running under it gives you how much memory they're using uh, as you can see they're actually pretty small their memory usage is very very low they can be limited at one gigabyte uh, a piece but each one of these is running at 34 megabytes which is very nominally very very small um, so uh, that's something people often enjoy about docker I'll clear that out. Um, so that's that's Docker. So that's basically how it goes. I'm going to shut down those Docker RF. Um, I've been using uh, remove uh, before, by the way, to remove a stop Docker image. You can force running images to stop with the dash F flag. And again, the little trick uh, to do all of them, Docker PSA Q to get only the, PID, the ID numbers for them. And that shuts them all down. So Docker, you can see now Docker PSA. I've got nothing running. All right, so in that diagram, what I was saying is if you want from here, you can go ahead and push those back to um, to Docker Hub or your private repository if you want. So you have your new local image. I've been spawning containers from it here. If I wanted to check that into my repository, I could push that back into Docker Hub or private registry. You saw before I had to do a commit, but that's only when I had made modifications to a container that I wanted to save back to an image. In this case, Dockerfile has made those modifications for me and written that to an image. So I don't need to do a commit. I'm just ready to do a push if I want. A lot of times people don't do it when they're only building Docker files off their home system. There's a little bit of a better way to push it back. And actually, that's what I'm going to show you next. So, um, but you can if you want. It's just something to keep in mind. So in the next parlance, you can actually do what's called an automated build of a Docker image in Docker Hub. And all you really need to do is get GitHub involved and it pushes, pushes things out for you. So I'm going to do an example of that here in a second. But what it starts with, you have a doc on your local file system, you have a Docker file with some cold code that you want to deploy or some modifications or changes to a disk that you want to deploy. All you need to do is create a, a GitHub repository and commit that and push it to your GitHub repository. From there, you establish hooks between your GitHub repository and your Docker Hub repository and tell it that when you see a new build in the, a new push into the Docker, a GitHub repository, do a build in Docker Hub automatically. You don't have to get involved yourself. You don't have to do the, the build yourself. So I, well, I'm going to take the project I just did and show you how, that, how that's done. Let's go ahead and close this out. And these applications aren't running, so let's close these. Um, you can see this should come up with can't reach host because um, it's not running. So over in Docker Hub, this is these are my various Docker hubs here. Uh, my Docker uh, uh, repositories here. I need to cr I need to have first created the GitHub repository I want to go to. So here I created a, a GitHub repository called DF Demo. There's nothing in it. I'm on the master branch. There's no other branches, and it's only been one commit. So I go over here, you see this little master thing. That means I already have a Git, uh, GitHub repository or Git repository initiated. I've already added the remote because I've checked in the readme, but I need to do something further. So let me get status. I have these files to add. Let me get, uh, actually, let me set up the, the uh, container first so you can see how an actual build goes. So um, uh, the, the Docker repository first. So if I go over to Docker, I have a existing GitHub repository. If I go over, I have to create, create an automated build. If you remember from my last episode, what I said was you can't build from a, um, if you built the wrong kind of repository, a regular repository versus a, uh, an automated build repository, you have to delete it. You can't uh, convert them back and forth. So make sure you choose the right one. You, you choose create automated build. Uh, you go ahead and you hit, um, GitHub is the place you want to pull it from. Uh, I belong to several organizations, so that's why you're seeing that there. And you know, I have a lot of repositories. So uh, DF demo, uh, find the repository you're looking for, click that. And it will it will give you the automated build and give it a little description, uh, a demo project for tutorial for a tutorial. I'll give it. So I, uh, visibility is public. Again, if unless you pay for it, you're generally going to be doing public uh, Docker repositories. You're going to hit uh, return. It would build if there were something there to build, but we have not yet committed anything to this repository. So there's no Docker file for it to build. So if I go over to Docker file, it'll say nothing. So build details, same thing, nothing here. If I go over to the build settings, however, and this is really what I wanted to show you, you can, you can configure it to build from different branches in Git, 
in GitHub and give those different tag names in Docker Hub. So by default, it's going to look for the, brand, the master branch and it's anything in master, when it gets a new commit to master, it's going to tag as latest. So that's the way people keep their latest build up to date. You can also set it to build tags and don't change this. It will give you some uh, regular expressions there to match it against. What it will do is at the, the Docker files in the root uh, of the GitHub project, you could say it's somewhere in, in a subdirectory if you wanted just by changing that. And by default, it uses the same as tag for the tag name so when you tag uh, when you tag a commit to uh, 0 0.1 and then push that to, to github it will automatically create a docker hub uh, image with that tag same tag number in it so that's how you can keep them uh, in sync and it's fairly easy to do so having this here let me go ahead uh, I, I need to docker uh, to me git add and uh, again that's a windows thing don't worry about that um, and I need to get commit adding docker files All right. and git push origin master so that's it it goes over to github it takes it and puts it up there now docker hub itself will take a second it will recognize um, that that push has happened and it will begin to build it and it'll tell you it's building it queues it up um, it can take anywhere it depends on how much load is over on the docker hub server it, it does a worker process to queue it up for build and it'll get ready to build it for you so the um so this process can go it, it could take any anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes and we probably all have time to sit here but that's all you do to actually get an image built and that's a great way people have to sort of create their environment ship it with their product a project at the same time and it uh, into their code base and it creates a a image of that in docker hub so there you just do docker pull to get whatever image you need down from docker hub and it's a, it's a cycle that works pretty well for most people so i've been doing a lot of these commands at the command line but just I, i've been i've been talking a little bit about docker files but that's the essence of what docker files are they're really not that complex all right, that's all I'm going to cover in this episode. Next time, I'm going to talk a little bit about linking containers and Docker networking, uh, and that'll prep me for a, a Docker uh, Compose tutorial I'm going to do at a conference next week, and I might post some videos before that, um, but uh, I'm not sure if I'll get to them before the conference. Uh, I hope you've got a chance to view some of these videos beforehand. But if you have any questions, comments, additions, corrections, anything like that, go ahead and add them in the, in the comments here in YouTube, and I'll try to respond if they need one. Uh, but in, in the meantime, thank you very much for viewing this video and making it in this far. Go ahead and play around with Docker. I hope you find it fun, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.